Okay, I guess we're going to get started. And um, most of you know Alejandro from class, but if you don't, this is Alejandro Crawford. And um, by way of introducing him, I wanted to talk a little bit about research that I'm doing and why it relates to what Alejandro is doing and how it may give you a way to think about what his art is all about. Uh, but for this last year, and a little bit longer, I've been doing research on a, uh, a concept that I'm calling virtual literature. And in some ways, I wanted to identify you know, what would be virtual literature. And I was thinking, well, it's not really, I don't really like the idea of virtuality being only, let's say, immersive spaces or game spaces or you know, VR headsets or whatever that there is something to the virtual that just has to do with our, every time we open an email, we're experiencing a virtuality. Because in some ways, what the virtual is, is not necessarily being immersed in some sort of dream space, but rather it's our capacity to filter all this massive data that we're interfacing constantly. And so when we actually decide, we make decisions, how are we going to act on all this data? Uh, what is what data is going to be used and what data is going to be useless. In some ways, to me, that's actually the core of what we call the virtual. And it goes back to certain things within French philosophy where the virtual is, has been theorized for the past um, 100 years, uh, well before electronic technology. So one of, the things, um, one of the things to think about is that we have different um, habits for the way in which we deal with this virtual, virtual right? Like we, we go to the same websites, we open the same sorts of emails, but we never find ways to actually, and some of, we've been doing this in class, right? Finding ways to search data that you wouldn't necessarily search, right? Finding like junk data, data that has nothing to do with you, uh, fragmented data, crappy GIFs, uh, you know, sort of, you know, text and comments boxes, like the whole dredge and the junk of the internet that doesn't really seem to us necessarily as an artistic form, uh, we're exploring that. And so, you know, one of the things that Alejandro does in his work is he takes on these massive amounts of data on the web and he uses that as his sculptural material. And you can think about, and you can think about this real element of this idea of the virtual in terms of, you know, if we're thinking about it in terms of what we've been talking about with the remix. Um, so, for example, if you get a song, if you download a song from iTunes, right, in some ways that would be the traditional form of the virtual, right? You're sort of, by some form of telepresence, you are experiencing an artist who is absent, right? And you're, enga and you're engaging in a sort of fairly corporately engineered system of like, I go to iTunes, I pay 99 cents, I get MGMT's MP3 that I experience and enjoy, right? But the whole logic of the remix is like, well, these are different patterns that somebody has engineered for me. However, how can I access data artistically without entering into somebody, uh, like for example, a corporate mode of the virtual, right? How do I engineer new relationships to the data around me? How do I act on data in new ways? And, and how can I remix not only the data itself, but also the system by which the data comes to me? And so not only is, is Alejandro dealing with um, data that he finds on the web, but he's also engineering new systems by which to act on that data. You know, so, for, so, so you'll see today, and those of you who are in class saw, you know, he has set up his Bonhomme system with a keyboard for one of his pieces, or he has, he has multiple pieces but which, which he uses, uses this with. But uh, you know, basically using a typically musical interface to um, trigger found videos on the internet. Um, you know, that is the kind of way in which he's engineered a system by which to find this data, but then also reshape it and, and constantly transform it in a live way. So that's, that's you know, some things to think about. Um, Alejandro's gonna read and play a couple pieces today. I think one of his pieces, BHO, might be, should we put a disclaimer on it? No disclaimer. In any case, you know, you know, sometimes when you're sort of going into the junk of the web, there is sort of, let's just say, 
you know, racy material. Uh, and, um, you know, and he went to uh, one of his pieces, which I think is his, is his, for I was telling him the other night, I think that is your southern poem, because Alejandro is from Georgia. And uh, this poem about Obama, with all the, the all of the junk in the comments box of a video of Obama, you know, and the hate and the sort of the, the racial politics and everything that bubbles to the surface there, um, is really something that Southern writers have dealt with sort of in a much more intimate way than Northern writers. And um, so I, so I actually find this this piece very interesting, and I hope you read some some of it. But it but it is. Uh, uh, what, I'm thinking of a word. What's the word for inflammatory, maybe? Racist. Racist, yeah, just like outright. <laughs> <laughs> Racist, yes. Um, nevertheless. All right, but with that, I guess I will leave it to Alejandro. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. I know that you're all here by your own will. You want to be here. You weren't made to be here. With that in mind, I'm going to start with uh, a, like a short little remix movie that I made a couple years ago um, when I was really interested in a lot of the kind of final cut stuff that you can do. Um, this is kind of a, I call it erotic poem. It's part of a YouTube trilogy that I had made. Um, the remix kind of girl talky music is from this Portland artist who at the time was like 21. He goes by Easter Egg. Uh, he's a phenomenal engineer. And whereas girl talks kind of spectrum it's very much like the radio pop, right? Uh, this guy, his spectrum is a lot more cacophonous and, uh, and uh, wider ranging, a lot more like weird experimental things that you may or may not hear in the background. At any rate, um, this is erotic poem. So I want to start off with this, and we'll watch this, and then I'll launch into something else. But I think this will uh, set the tone, I hope. Thank you. 
So, lesson number one about the internet. It's gross. <laughs> um, politics aside, it's just gross. There's everything, right? Um, so that piece was at like the height of my, not the height maybe, but it was when I was really interested in, in the medium of uh, Final Cut, if you can call it a medium. Because you have all this stuff all over the place. You can get it from anywhere, and you can just mix and weave. And uh, we can talk about it later if you guys want to. But I'm going to keep going. Um, there's a computer language called Python, which is a text-based language. This is a very simple set of code. Um, what it's asking is, in any text document, so you, ha you go to the internet, right? you have TXT files. Uh, they can be whatever. They can be like a Mark Twain novel. They could be uh, Barack Obama's State of the Union address. In this case, for this poem, I was really interested in um, a book called The Exploit by Alexander Galloway and Eugene Thacker. It's kind of a theory of networks and how they function and how, uh, how they exist. Um, but this code can be applied to anything. Basically, what it's saying is, um, hey, code, go through this text document. Every time you find a sentence beginning the, capital or not capital, uh, and take, find it, take the next two words after it, so the blank blank, uh, then put the word text after that, and then find every instance of the word of the prepositional phrase of blank blank. So the blank blank text of blank blank. It's going to search through the document and it's going to uh, immediately deliver the results. So let me just get over to the folder it's in, right? So now we say python dissolve.py, which is the name of the code. And we're going to go inside this TXT file, make me a poem. All right, and so this is like a 300-page book that it just kind of did it really fast. You can see how long the poem is. It's, it clocks about 500 and some pages, maybe. Um, there's a PDF of it. The, the thing about it is, because it's randomly going through, every iteration will be different, right? So I could run this a million different times, and the poem would be, there would be a million versions of the poem. Um, and it's really remarkable. It's really beautiful. Let's see what this one sounds like. Start from the beginning, because that's what you do with poems. <clears throat> the research in text of the division the relative openness text of technological systems, the political economy text of the edges, the network is text of single strands, the case with text of view of the biological disaster text of the biological, the most F text of networks in, the United States text of a biological, the ubiquity of text of new media, the body politic text of a new, the non-distinction between text of genetic adaptability, the opposite in text of protocol does, the computer virus text of the past, the ability to text of political action, the rise of text of world war, the development of text of an arty, the question is text of a support, the 20th century text of symmetry in and it just keeps going on and on. I could read all of it if you guys want me to, <laughs> but I won't. Not today. Um, in a kind of kindred spirit to that, uh, another Python-based poem that I did um, that just came out in a little magazine with this other BHO disclaimer needed poem. Um, is, is called State of the Union.txt. It was not this year's State of the Union, but I guess it was the first State of the Union that Barack Obama gave. This one is fun to do with a little audience support. So what I asked the computer to do in this instance, I gave it the State of the Union and I said, find every parenthetical instance of applause, which there were a number of them, because the State of the Union is filled with all kinds of wonderful pomp and circumstance. And then uh, complete the line. So what happens is it becomes a really uh, hard poem to read because you feel like you're constantly getting cut off by the applause. So you guys be the applause. 
I'll read. As soon as I get to the end, applause again. So ready? Go. That's why we're building a 21st century VA. And that's always. And, and at April's Nuclear Security Summit, we will bring 44 nations. And if, and if the Republican leadership, and let's tell, and that's why we'll continue to shape a DOA. And this year, I'm eager, and we're on track to add another one. And, uh, and when the vote comes tomorrow, the Senate should, and yes, it means passing a comprehensive energy and climate bill with, as the first, because the more products we make and, but realizing those benefits also means enforcing those agreements. So our, all right, so I'm not gonna read all of it, but you get the idea. Um, Python, look it up, it's great. Let's see, what do I wanna do next? What does my schedule tell me I'm doing next? Oh, that looks pretty cool. That looks pretty cool, right? I just wanted to see what that looked like because it looks cool. Anyway. Uh, next on the agenda, Morfeo. I wrote a book once called Morfeo. Uh, they gave me a, a, what's called a Fulbright scholarship for it. Um, I, what I told them I was going to do was there was uh, in Portugal, at the beginning of the 20th century, modernism is taking over uh, the world literary map. And by world, I mean Europe. Um, Portugal had never really been part of a, a global literary movement, really. Uh, they adopted a lot of stuff from French, French culture. Um, there wasn't really much kind of Anglo-Portuguese interaction until Fernando Pessoa came around. He was a South African educated Portuguese guy and now he's like their famous poet, right? Um, there's statues of him, so I guess that makes him famous. Uh, so what, what did I do? Well, there was this magazine called Orfeo, Orpheus Magazine, in 1915. Fernando Pessoa and this other guy, Marid Sacarneiro, they wanted to like make the, like, the coolest magazine in Portugal at the time. And they were both into what was going on uh, in France, what was going on in England, what was going on in Russia with the Futurists and the Italians. Um, and so they were kind of trying to break out of what they considered to be like drab, old poetry. I mean, it's the age-old generational thing. Like, we're sick of these people. They're doing boring stuff. We need to do like new stuff. And they, they created this magazine. It lasted for two issues. Uh, the third issue made it to page proofs, but Marid Sakarneru's father was funding it. He's like, I'm not going to fund your stupid little magazine anymore. You guys don't like make any money. Uh, Marid Sakarneru committed suicide. That was the end of that project. Uh, the magazine, over time, in Portuguese culture, became a huge buzzword. Everybody's heard of Orfeo. Not many people have actually read it. And to tell you the truth, a lot of the poetry, what I, what I came to find was, a lot of the poetry in that magazine is not, is not that great. Um, but a lot of it became famous because of a couple key figures. And so I told the Fulbright people, I was like, let me translate it. I want to use it, I want to translate it in English. It hasn't been done. Um, but I had no intention of, of academically translating it, right? Like who, what am I doing? Like, do you guys want to read Orfeo? Because it's in Portuguese, but here it is in English. Um, that wasn't really my intention. What I told them I was going to do uh, was kind of more or less that I was going to use it as a giant word bank. Um, text as word bank. So I have all this Portuguese and then sometimes I take the wrong definition. Uh, sometimes I take the homonym. It's called homophonic translation. Uh, sometimes I would just use Google Translate, translate this page. Um, there's a million different kind of word games uh, that you can play. So over time it kind of snowballed into this narrative poem about this clown figure named Pierrot who's on a ship and the ship is made of glass and they set sail and he has like this like um, secretary figure named Jim Barnes and they're on they're on the sea and it's unclear whether the ship sinks or or the the sea drains and then there's like a kind of uh, Moloch the moon figure uh, Piero is stranded on a desert island with a complimentary letter opener that he's given 
Uh, he ends up committing suicide. Um, you should buy it, the book. That would, uh, that would be good for everyone involved, including myself. I'm going to read putting it on the screen so you get kind of the graphic layout of it. This is, uh, I suppose, the, what do you call that? The argumentum. It's kind of a Miltonian thing. Um, just the, the preface, right? The, so here we go. Mission briefing. How vague? Omicron vague. OMG? Well, is it homotopic? Container. Your eyes, we have sheep dipped in a cool, salty wash. We call you an agglutination. We call you Pierrot, the mariner, the back engineer of the boat. The boat? Container. The craft. The ship. The SS Nantucket, to be clear. We sail? Dilating time? Do you know of the island of stability? I do. Good. Here. Have a complimentary letter opener. Bon voyage. Chapter one, traces of gold. Taciturn, with lips that murmur what Confederate winds press back, and heavy breath that wangs, there is gold inlaid in me. Encrusted with rare stones, ominous gold, the very clank of medieval bronze. What is precious, though, is faceted in a make do varnish. That is initial and will bleed another instance. That makes for a slow start, though the soul will twerk its tender, lathering itself in a salve of scalar radiation, whereby the nearest glyph will slalom mole to mole down, down the nape of its own neck, as does the beating sweat the sun cajoles along the rim of its smug meniscus paring its thinning blood by the metal of its smooth pursuit, feeding off the tallow of a warm, rich cicade, chiefing its bling, a hot-boxed, whole-grain cyborium. What is a true caucus of loss is holding its writ by the node of its wizened proxy, snuffing its trysts. You're mourning your quiet hooves, your pigeon-toed, paradiddle-diddle, paradiddle-diddle flam, ratamacue, and then the bass dropped beneath your capsid in the hull of your chiral center, said Piero. Piero liked sucking on a pecan log from time to time. Piero liked the poop deck for the view. I remember prick, phase shift. Once there was a princess, the word stuck, trust me. My trill aphasia, your leafed and lamellar cask like those helmets Moloch's teams got. Their catalyzed platinum ping in the tortoise shell style. Glottal stomp. There was a clown. It wrapped its monocle to clear an atavistic throat. A vessel indeed, end quote. So that continues for about uh, 200 more pages. I won't read all of it. Next, I'm going to play the Vonome for a little while. Joe has this really cool Korg Nano. Um, it's a MIDI controller. It's kind of designed for the traveling musician. So like you can do this on the train, in the subway, in the hotel, uh, in the park, in the classroom with the students, which is what I'm going to do. Um, I wrote this code that many of you I kind of gleaned or showed you a little bit of um, in class, the Vonome. Uh, one translation project I did with it is, is, a, is a poem I call Milk. Now. Gertrude Stein, you guys familiar with Gertrude Stein? She was like, um, she's like grandma modernism from America. She, she was one of the first people to really write really cool, interesting, like uh, a rose is a rose is a rose, like really weird, decentered language stuff. You should look up tender buttons if you haven't. It'll blow your mind probably. Um, but there's one, one of the poems, it's called Milk. So tender buttons is set up like food, objects, rooms, I think. Um, and this one, this particular poem is called Milk. We can find it real fast on the internets. And that'll, that'll help me explain this to you. You don't need to see my inbox. Uh, Gertrude Stein, Tender Buttons, there it is. 
me search for food. Congratulations, I'm a winner. I don't want to be a winner. Milk. This is a Gertrude Stein poem. Milk, a white egg in a colored pan, a cabbage showing settlement, a constant increase. Cold in a nose, a single cold nose makes an excuse, two are more necessary. All the goods are stolen, all the blisters are in the cup. Um, so, I YouTube searched every phrase, sometimes the complete sentence, sometimes like a cold in a nose, a single cold nose makes an excuse. And then I chose what I deemed to be the most appropriate YouTube video result. Um, problem with YouTube is we're not at the point where we're tagging the actual audio of the video, right? So what we're tagging is, is, uh, is the content of the video. Um, but for all intents and purposes, I decided to do a translation project uh, based on this. So I gathered a database that represented to me the entire poem. And then I mapped that whole database onto the keyboard, effectively translating in some way the Gertrude Stein. So let's see. I'll see if I can play a little bit of this for you. Let me do it this way. Because I want to use, yeah, I'll just do it this way. Retaining all the goodness of the vegetable itself. It's probably not what you think. Okie dokie. Retaining all the goodness of... They have been trained to use GPS. I'm going to turn your world upside down a little bit. I'm, while this might sound a bit strange, putting pressure on the prospect and creating an adversarial position right from the start. I'm going to turn your world upside down a little bit. I'm going to turn your world upside down a little bit. Try to make it as tight as I can get it. Try to make it as tight as I can get it. What? Try to make it as tight as I can get it. Try to make it as tight as I can get it. Try to make it as tight as I can get it. While this might sound a bit strange, while this might sound a bit, while 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 this might sound a bit strange, what am I going to do next year for an encore? How can I go ahead and sell this person? Craig is a three-time defending world record holder. We're rolling up the skillet. Putting pressure on the prospect and creating an adversarial position right from the start. They're all symbols. Dreams are unfulfilled wishes. Unfulfilled dreams. What is going on? Unfulfilled dreams. Unfulfilled wishes. I actually la looked at it several times, dying laughing. They're all symbols. But I would like to say at the same time, they're all symbols. But I would like to say at the same time, this is a straight up H A M video. Hey. We've got a health alert for your family. There are some risks that are always associated with stimulant medication. I'm the producer here. I'm the producer here. I already know that. I'm the producer here. I already know that. Doctors sought to determine if there was a link between sudden unexplained death in children. I already know that. I already know that. So when I look at it and, and you know when, when stuff happening, I'm not I'm not the one so easy to be frustrated and pissed off and and and, and act like a, like I'm gonna kill myself every time something what is going on? Try to make it as tight. Try to make it as tight. You just have to show him who's boss. How can I go ahead and sell this person? Unfulfilled wishes. We've got a health alert for your family. The collective unconscious. 
While this might sound a bit strange, the same for the everyone. For American collector unconscious is not different from the collector unconscious of uh, The collective of conscious brings unfulfilled wishes. But I would like to say at the same time, I already know that. Do you want to control them? And yet there's a huge amount of me in there. Um, you know, I prefer girls. So that's a little sample from milk. Wasted. I wrote a poem called Wasted. Now, I'm going to use the term wrote liberally because I don't, I don't remember the last time I sat down and wrote a poem like I'm going to write a poem. Um, Wasted is a, a poem based on, you guys know T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland? Um, I happen to have at my a house this, the year that I was writing this a copy of the facsimile of The Wasteland. And the story behind The Wasteland is, is one of kind of collaboration, maybe isn't the right word, between uh, T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound. T.S. Eliot wrote this giant thing called The Wasteland. It was this big, big thing. And he gave it to Ezra Pound, and Ezra Pound just like, nope, you don't need that, you don't need that, this is bad, did you really mean that? And he sculpted it, he really changed it. And what we know today as The Wasteland is really uh, is almost really Ezra Pound's poem, you could say, or almost like a remix of a bunch of unedited stuff that T.S. Eliot had. But then there's still the question of all that other material that was in the original Wasteland. Um, and it's in this facsimile, and I thought it would be, would be cool to use it as a source text. And that's, that's what Wasted is. It's all the wasted material from the Wasteland. Um, strike throughs and everything. And, uh, when I read it with the strike throughs, because you'll see, I'll start somewhere later on. Um, and this kind of preserves the page layout. Uh, I'm going to read it so that we can kind of have an audio version of the strike throughs. I'm going to use some static to represent that um, audio static. So let's try. Let's try. But F rules. Governs, she reigns, no less, appeared once, unexpected, divinity's celestial pace, packed, close, millions, the sweating rabble, thousands, identify, know, sees on the screen, can recognize, heaven, in reverent, reverent, your N or Ed, perhaps, damn, perhapses, keep BS, only Palmer Cox's brownies, to spring to pleasure through the horn or ivory gates, vide, other copy, one of these, associate, carbuncular, will stare. Solely, quickly, responsive, their, their chords of little what they think and much less what they feel. Spectral, goblins tunneling, aberrant minds, unbalanced brains. So I'm going to read just that little bit. Um, you can find these online, different places. Um, Second Life, we talked a little bit about that on, when was that, Tuesday? Um, so Second Life, I, I did a bunch of voyeuristic kind of 
documentary film. And uh, I just watched a lot of people. So every single kind of um, video game looking character that you're going to see here, keep in mind, is like a real person logged in to Second Life, the equivalent of like their AIM screen name. And they're all just hanging out. Um, and I came up with this idea because of the way the camera would kind of float around and I was able to do that, I, I, in my head it seemed like a little like surveillance robot. And so with that in mind, I wanted to kind of aestheticize the notion of a floating surveillance robot. And so I went to places like freesound.org and I'd type in like static beeps, like kind of like that beep you just heard, or, or computer sound, or, uh, or uh, field recording of a, of a public park. And then since you guys all are studying Final Cut, you can imagine all the layering you can do with the audio. So it's like everything here is, is sculpted. Like none of this really happened. I suppose you can consider it pretty pure animation. But uh, I'll play the last little bit of this because um, I, I really like this movie and I haven't, I haven't put it out yet, so to speak. Thank <laughs> you. 
Second life, a lot of fun. <clears throat> How's uh, Slavodov Zizek's voice? Um, I like to think that my robot is a curious little thing who wants to know about his own consciousness. So he listens to Slovenian 
Lacanian theorist Slavodov Zizek to try to figure it out. Uh, BHO. BHO is a, is a data sculpture, as Joe was saying. Barack Hussein Obama. This was written during the elections. Uh, there was some video, I can't remember what, but it definitely polarized the YouTube audience. And I was really, I was struck by this uh, particular video and, and how, how many comments there were. And so I copy and pasted all of it, um, all 2,000 plus comments, divorced the comments from the username and the timestamp so that you get kind of what will sound more or less like a schizophrenic monologue. Uh, as if like the person can't actually decide on their opinion. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of it. Maybe I'll read it to a beat so I can kind of bebop my way through this nonsense. Ha ha ha, you are right. Rich people don't have a disproportionate influence in politics. It's no big deal that Obama was a communist apprentice for 10 years or that half the people in his entourage are skull and bones or that he has no experience or that he just appeared out of nowhere to become the next president. Everything is okay. Your vote counts. The economy is just about to pick up again and you'll never have to fight for anything. I can't wait to watch the world burn to the ground. Oh, spooky. Watch the world burn to the ground, huh? Evil communism, skulls and bones. Oh my, take a sedative. Politics is pure entertainment. Used to divert attention from the scrutiny of the real legislative infrastructures. The anti Christ, yet another fear measure based on faulty information. Those that wish to cultify the pursuit of fact-based reasoning relish to the reverence of concepts like the Antichrist. Sadly, too many still turn to religion as an intellectual platform. It is not. You're wrong. There only, not only was outrage, but the killers were portrayed in the most negative way possible. Do a search. It was big news in the national media. Two of the killers are on death row. Also, Texas passed the James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Act as a result. David Duke, skinheads, came KKKers may have infiltrated your dreams, but are considered to be fringe slash wacko elements by mainstream white Americans. In fact, there are so few KKKers, 5,000 according to the ADL, that they cannot possibly be a threat to millions of innocent black men, women, and children. Much less, much, much less of a threat than black gangbangers are to their fellow black people 11 months ago. We need peace, Obama 2008. There is going to be no peace. We're going to enter the Great Tribulation. You are so right, and he will be loved by many. Okay, Mark Furman, with your stereotypical bullshit. This is exactly what Jeremiah Wright was talking about. Say hello to your new president, you brainwashed simpletons, especially women and students. Search. The shocking comment, Barack Obama, Pennsylvania, must give Hill Clinton an overwhelming victory to save USA major cities. Search for racist. President Obama is not telling the truth. Check date and about this video. The audacity of Barack Obama to give me some truth, Obama, hitting this is anti-American. Obama is a wolf in sheep's clothing? What is George Bush then? I will tell you, Satan in president's clothing. Yeah, listen up. He is the Antichrist. Have your eyes open, folks. It's time, LOL. It was probably that gas you huffed in middle school. Conspiracy theories offer simple explanations to events. Appearances deceive. Conspiracies drive history. Nothing is haphazard. The enemy always gains. Power frame, money, and sex account for all. Well, on one hand, you satisfy the need to understand a complex and intricate world. On the other, there's the ego lift that you have it all figured out, while the ignorant masses are just sheep who don't get it. How about you investigate your own self-serving bias? Don't you get me wrong. There's lots of useful info in this vid. Lots of bad things to look out for. National ID cards, implanted chips, retina palm, voice scans, etc. And the Bilderberger meetings are creepy and corrupt and merit intense scrutiny, but the sad tendency is to try to fit everything into the same theory, which is just feeble-minded wishful thinking. And I would like, I would bet a lot of money that the poster of this video only seems to support the theory, i.e. has not read Obama's books, etc. First American presidential candidate sold to the electorate by a pair of 54-inch triple D tits. Obama's girl. Fuck. Now, I can honestly say, I have seen it all. No wonder no one commented about Obama's enormous ears. Everyone was watching those huge tits bounce. Well, I guess you can sell anything. Even a crackhead politician with a pair of 54 double Ds. One, 
Fagan has articulated a comprehensive theory of racial oppression in the U.S. in his book Systematic Racism, A Theory of Oppression, Rutledge, 2006. Fagan examines how major institutions have been built upon racial oppression, which was not an accident of history, but was created intentionally by white Americans. In Fagan's view, white Americans labored hard to create a system of racial oppression in the 17th century and have worked diligently to maintain the system ever since, too. While Fagan acknowledges that changes have occurred in this racist system over the centuries, key and fundamental elements have been over-reproduced for nearly four centuries, and that U.S. institutions today reflect the racialized hierarchy created in the 17th century, a highly organized system of race based on group privilege that operates at every level of society and is held together by a sophisticated ideology of race supremacy. Racism in the United States since the 17th century constituted the destruction of culture, language, religion, and human possibility. The effects of racism were the morally monstrous destruction of human possibility involved redefining African humanity to the world, poisoning past, present, future relations. Whew, my diaphragm hurts, so I'm going to just scroll through the rest. Obama, Obama, Obama. I feel that this video is very insightful and well done. Opinions, people have them. Keeps going. All right, and so the last thing I'm going to do is play my Vonum some more. What are the forms of non-reading and what are the non-forms the reading might take? They are my poems. What are the forms of non-reading and what are the non-forms the reading might take? They are my poems. They are my poems. I decided not to escape to Canada. <laughs> I decided not. I decided. I decided not. I decided. I decided. I decided not. I decided. I decided not. I decided. I decided. I decided. I decided not. I decided. I decided. Complicated actions. So I should also have a view. I decided not. Getting up. I'm having a drink. Getting up. I'm having a coke with you. <laughs> Grandfather. I look forward to old age with some excitement. Hypnotized into some false universe of just pure imagery. Hypnotized into some false universe of just pure imagery. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
forms of non leaving and all the non forms of leaving in my feet. All the forms of non
So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, no, that was before the days of, of computer coding. That was all Final Cut and uh, stuff off of YouTube that I would download and um, wherever else it came from. The audio and the video just came from the internet and then, you know, if it's on the internet, it's fair game. And uh, then I just started stitching it in, in Final Cut. Anybody else have any? Yeah. Yes. Just up there. Sure. How did that happen? The Barack Hussein Obama poem? Yeah. No, the, the, how it ended up in right. It's just it's just justified. So you can go left margin or right margin, okay. center or justified in Microsoft Word. So how come there's so much space? Because um, when you copy and paste things, sometimes there's not like it's not a hard return a lot of times, yeah. which would make it go to the next line. Mm -hmm. So a lot of stuff from the internet is you. Everybody knows this from copying and pasting from the internet. Like the formatting can be kind of funny. And uh, as soon as I just hit the, the justified button in Microsoft Word, um, it just pulled it all out. And I was like, wow, that looks really, really beautiful. Um, so there's always that argument, I guess, nowadays with software and everything, even something as simple as Microsoft Word, where, where there's an intent on the author or the poet's part and the, or the artist. And then there's kind of this like weird little robotic collaboration between you and, and Microsoft Word or whatever. And sometimes aesthetic decisions come by accident from, uh, from the piece of software. That's a good example of that, I suppose. Yeah, it looked really cool. Some of it. Yeah, especially the stuff that, uh, where it kind of pulls apart in these weird little like uh, mm -hmm. cascades, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. Anybody else? 
question? Cool, you guys get it. It's great. The rent, the rent? Yeah. Oh. With the Python right. poems, have you found that I'm I'm wondering about quality wise, like whether mm. you dif can differentiate with whether in your own method you differentiate the quality of those poems based on your own search strings? Like have you found that by you know, taking the word and then the two words after it, that's gonna give you better results than just the first word after it or uh -huh. sometimes you playing around have you yeah. work with a method for quality as opposed to just it generating some kind of nonsense from the Right. Um, I don't know. Quality is a, is a funny word to me because, you know, it's, it, it can be as simple as like one man's junk is another man's treasure kind of thing. Some things that I find compelling, other people might not find compelling in the least. And some things that I find really interesting, um, other people might find um, dull and boring and, and, and frankly bad. Um, so I try not to look at it. Uh, I, I kind of I have my own sensibilities, and I seem to know more or less when um, when something is good. Um, trying to pull up something that might well, so give a good answer. On the, that was on the, the green screen. Sure. From uh, the, the exploit. Uh, the actor book. Um, <clears throat> the was the first word of every sentence. Right. Was, did did you generate that, or was that because of, from the of it was always? That the was the first yeah. line of every. Was the first word of every line. Did yeah. You tell it to do that. Or? Well, yeah, because what it's asking, I'm asking the computer to do is to to find every instance of anything that starts the blank blank, oh, and right. so when it comes back, it's coming back, and every line is is going to be Sorry, starting with the. Sorry, that's my ear. I thought you said V, and then I was uh, right. in the code, and I saw, I thought it was maybe a B. But right. I just didn't hear yeah. No. 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 Yeah. It's cool. I was thinking maybe because it was always of the or something, it was right. the, the from the of and putting sure. it in the I mean, it would be interesting to, I'm, I love relationships between prepositions, and it would be great to see, to just be, to do a search of prepositions to see what Totally. I mean, that's, a, yeah, that's a thing with, with, uh, prepositions, you know? with data banking and, and this kind of poetry. There's room for everything, you know. Um, that goes for everything um, in general, especially with the internet as this kind of giant cosmic hard drive. Uh, quality control is not an issue. Um, you know, if you can, if you could, I mean, I could have this code go a little further, right? You could kind of have it to where it's grabbing things from the internet on, let's say, a daily basis. It's grabbing them from the internet, it's putting them into a PDF, it's creating a really simple, like, uh, title page, it's going to Lulu, it's uploading it, it's publishing a book, and then you could imagine an artist who conceptually is publishing a book on the daily, right? So like by the end of the year you could say I've published 365 books or something like that. I mean quality control, I don't know. That, I'll, I'll let other people decide I suppose on that, if that makes sense. Well there is an aspect, I mean, did somebody have a head up? Yeah, a head up. Let me see if I understand. Like when I'm home practicing, if I ever record it. Right. Is it possible to record? Or? Oh yeah, totally. It's, instead of like chopping up the editing and final cut, like just using their triggering. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's. Uh, I think that this this instrument, to a large degree, came out of a need, my own personal need to, to be able to, spontaneously create uh, different edited variations without using something like Final Cut and then hitting Command R and going and getting a Coke and waiting 15 minutes while like it renders and then like coming back. Um, so yeah, it's definitely possible. And uh, you know, there are a couple studio recordings, so to speak, of this that exist. I guess they would be like more like DVD type recordings because there's a video component. But it's definitely possible to record anything. I mean, any output on your computer is recordable. So yeah. How did you start doing this remixing stuff? And 
I take it from what you said that you also did more traditional poetry. Mm -hmm. but, so the other half of the question is, how did these feed into each other? How did they sure. Um, when I was doing a lot of writing, it got to a point where, especially as I started to kind of study through the 20th century, particularly by the time I got to language poetry and a lot of the poetry of the 70s, um, it seemed that creativity to a large degree had exhausted itself, in my opinion. Um, you know, you always have that thing where it's like you're young and, and you find something and you're like, this is the cleverest shit ever. It's awesome. And then you study a little bit and you see that like, oh, some dude did that in like the 60s. Not that clever. Um, and there's like countless examples of a lot of stuff. And, and I think as far as compositional, creative projects, I had gotten um, kind of, I don't want to say that it, it became boring to me in any way, but um, writing in a kind of like, um, you know, poet sitting down with quill and ink inspired and writing a poem with line breaks and formalities didn't interest me as much. And that led me to sculpting text um, from the internet or from other books or, you know, having a book and Sometimes I would go to my library and find books that I had um, annotated and underlined things. And maybe, for example, I took um, on the discard shelf of our library, there was a book by Zig Ziglar, who's like a notorious charlatan uh, motivator. See You at the Top is the name of the book. And I noticed that somebody, presumably a lady because it was pink pen, um, had underlined you know, all the lines in the book that, uh, that she thought were, I guess, inspiring. You, know, um, you must go out on the limb because the fruit is on the limb. Uh, and I thought it was a really, really interesting book. Somebody else had experienced it, had underlined what they thought was interesting. And so I just transcribed every single line that was underlined in pink pen, uh, creating a kind of new work out of that. And so this became my practice was more like a detritus-based practice, um, kind of like a, maybe a little bit greener rather than, and I remember at some point reading some quote from Language Magazine that one of my professors at Georgia, Jed Rasula, had said back in like the 70s, and it was like, I think we've gotten to the point in history where there exists enough writing or something like that, that, that we could never read everything that's already there. Um, and that was, that was kind of uh, a poignant quotable for me. And then on top of that, I've always been interested in video and the kind of visual aspect of language. And, um, and since the 20th century, I mean, with advertising and media, and, uh, and especially with commercials more than anything, um, I don't see how, you know, if you think of poetry and writing as a kind of RNA, like a single strand of information, I think that the world we live in now is more of a kind of double helix of an audiovisual. So I just didn't think that writing on its own really cut it anymore in terms of if the poet is, and I'm not saying he definitely is or she is, uh, this kind of synthesizer of human experience. If the poet is going to be that, um, then to, to simply write on paper, presumably, um, didn't really cut it for, like, for, for trying to synthesize this human experience that we all have, which is to say um, the textual language is not the only language we experience on a daily basis. On top of that, um, our reading practices with the rise of the internet have completely shifted. So um, the kind of paper paradigm poet thing didn't communicate as honestly to me as um, the way that you can digitally represent things. Uh, you know, we read left to right in a book. Uh, that was the great alternative to the kind of scroll of medieval times pre-codex. And now we've kind of returned to this weird scroll world where we're constantly scrolling down. And there's also like, so there's like an X and a Y axis, you could think of it, but there's also like a Z axis, this kind of hyperlink world where you click, you know, the clunky footnote is gone and now we can click inside things. And so as far as textual stuff goes, we can go anywhere. Um, but that's still just text and so like video became really important to me and then a lot of the final cut stuff I would try to kind of synthesize the, the kind of cacophony of, of life I suppose, you know, because it's not just, it's like you might be at a bar and, and there's, they're, they're playing music but then like Terminator is on TBS, muted, but then with this new soundtrack that is like whatever music is playing too and that's like a very real element of everybody's lives and so I was trying to I suppose synthesize those kind of experiences. And then I started learning how to write code and, and it became a lot more um, user-friendly for me. That, does that answer? Yeah, it does. Cool.
cool. Uh, one quick question is Jed Russell, is he using other media? Or is he Absolutely not. No, he's doing his thing, writing books, being brilliant. But um, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think he's writing code or hyperlink poems and essays. I hope he doesn't see that on the camera. <laughs> I love you, Jed. <laughs> Joe. Um, just to go back a little bit to what Arendt was saying, it's, it seems then that. You know, I wonder how these, how you think of the status of quote unquote finished piece. Mm. You know, and if there is a terminus at all, because it seems like uh, the work is so modular, or even something like BHO is because you have decided not to have, you're making, you're obviously making aesthetic choices, but they are in some ways soft aesthetic choices. And so, you know, like for example, I was thinking about my experience of reading BHO was that I saw this come out, I looked at it, I was like, this is a 95 page word pile, I have no time to read this. Mm. And reading it might be a, precisely a waste of time, right? You know, and, and so I was sort of like, you know, and you know, knowing that it was, knowing full well that it was brilliant, but also at the same time saying to myself, is it brilliant enough, right? And then I sort of thought, well wait, you know, part of this, experience of writing this, I mean, it was done for a publication that it was about peripheral, things that were peripheral to one's poetic practice. And I thought about, well, you know, if I actually peripherally read this, I could probably read it better mm. if I sat down with it, I printed it out, and w read it word for word. And so, you know, I sort of put it through, put a couple pages through a, a video generator and, and watched it on the screen. Sure. And sort of like put on the voice voice activator in my Macintosh and mm. I have these old baby monitors in my house and I put on the baby monitor and I sort of strapped it on and I did my chores right. and so sort of listen to this as a kind of yeah. ambient thing, right? And so yeah. so I'm actually probably the only person maybe who's read the whole thing. I don't know that I've read the whole thing. See <laughs> and and so you know, so the question I mean, so I guess like what that points to is like this is well not only is it's reframing reading practices, but also like, is that a form of determinants? Like, does the artwork not, does the artwork right. as the PDF not really stop, but it invites, you're, you're, you're also creating another database. You're not creating a finished sure. product. You're creating a kind of like, this is the archive of this right. moment. And then it's almost making itself open for various recontextualizations, remediation. Right. Remediation. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the notion of a terminus I mean, from the individual standpoint, yeah, things finish. You can finish something, you can say it's finished, you can get bored with it and never, never work on it again. Um, but in the same spirit of like the way the internet just functions, you know, it might be finished for me, but as soon as it's on the internet, you're right, it's another, it's another piece that somebody else can continue the chain and do something else to. Um, it's all data, I mean, I think it's, a lot of this is like data jockeying, and so, and so with with BHO, I mean, I think it's a mix of, of some of the other older poets um, that have influenced me. I mean, certainly Tan was the editor of that magazine, and his ambient poetics resonate highly with me. Um, and then even somebody like Kenneth Goldsmith, who, who will copy the New York Times, you know, word for word, cover to cover, and then send it to a publisher and publish it as a book called Day. Uh, Who's, who, who's gonna read all of that, right? I mean, um, so there's the object, and then there's the poem, and then there's the idea. Sometimes, I mean, you could very well write a book of ideas for books, and then leave it at that, and maybe never execute them, or allow somebody else to execute them, but um, in terms of a finished product, I tend to think that I know when something is finished, but I'll, I'll, I'll usually obsessively work on something until I think it's finished. And if I don't, it usually means that it, it kind of just sits in a, in a kind of uh, little pool of stagnation and never leaves that after a certain, and then maybe it's finished because <laughs> I have no interest in finishing it. Um, but yeah. Poems to be looked at. reference 
to poems to be looked at sort of rang a bell. Poems it's Tan Lin. It is Tan Lin. Mm. Yeah. Versus poems to be sampled or something like that. Yeah, so yeah, there's a, there's a rejoinder to that. All right. Well, thank you for coming out. Those of you who are in the 330 class, make sure you sign the sign-up sheet for your meetings next week. If you're in the 545 class, uh, you can wait until 545 class because we are having class at 545 today. So remember, you need to be there. Um, so I'll see you soon.